I do not want to live in a world where Brooklyn Moores loses a tiebreaker because two judges were wrong about two other routines. We totally hear you. I do think it is interesting that we have had to invoke the NQS tiebreak because why are some athletes' performances good enough on the day and others are then matter. critiqued right. based on a, a collection of days? Tumble Track is having a sale, 10% off camp countdown stuff. Everybody needs stuff for camp and laser beams. I remember when Coach Rick told us a long time ago that laser beams are going to be the future and they're going to be at every gym around the world, and now they are. So you guys can get, there's a deal, there's a sale on those. Visit Tumble Track at T-U-M-B-L-T-R-A-K, tumbletrack.com, train smart. Regionals chaos did not disappoint. Individuals were almost totally ignored, as usual, uh, by the scoring. We have a lot to discuss about the Florida regional scoring. And by that, I mean my personal feelings. And we have some gym internet news to discuss. It is April 9th. Welcome to the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. And filling in for our beloved Spencer from the Balance Beam situation, who is under the weather, is Gymcastic alum, NCAA champion, and Gymnastics TV. The analyst, Evan Heider. Hello. <laughs> I am humbled and honored to be here as always. If, you know, Spencer's, uh, you know, maybe prescription shoes will be hard to fill, but I will do my best. And like we were talking, uh, you know, before we started, Jess, this is going to be a feelings one. If you're looking for comparative analysis and regressions over cosine, not happening, not happening <laughs> today. It's just going to be full on from matters of the heart. Amen. Um, this Friday, Behind the Scenes is back at our regular time, noon Pacific. So if you'd like to join, if you have questions you want to ask, that'll be live Friday at noon Pacific. Um, only a few days left to get your live show tickets. With a gymnastics royalty, you can attend virtually or in person, either way. And if you're virtual, if you get a virtual ticket, you can ask questions. We try to split them up half and half in person and virtual get asked in Fort Worth, April 19th, you can watch the replay if you get a virtual uh, ticket for two weeks after. You will be there in person, right, Evan? I'll be there. Yes. Evan very much enjoys the margarita jug stand that does a discount for the Gymcastic Live show ticket holders across the street. Ooh. I actually yes. have never partaken. I, I don't think there's a need for more. You know, it's like the foundation is laid and then it's just... <laughs> I, it, the live show is just coasting, coasting, coasting into the night. I always assumed from your happiness level at the show that you had partaken in the jugs. No, baby, that's the mezzanine <laughs> bar at Dickie's Arena providing, you know, vodka soda after vodka soda, which is a dangerous game that I'm learning to play better year over year. Well, um, I can't wait to see you there. As usual, um, we do have breaking news about one Olympic champion, reigning Olympic champion, Suni Lee, who posted a video of herself doing a casual Jaeger full two pack to Maloney, a toe on Shaposh, to a Bahard wash. Because is there any, when is she going to add a Kovach? That's what I want to know. Because what can't <laughs> she do? Truly. So I mean, when, if, if Kathy Johnson's gasps are fading or fading out of the the gym internet. Scott Bregman's screams are fading in and that's what we're <laughs> getting right now. Um, yeah, it was amazing to see. And I think like so many, it's uh, you're just watching it over and over again to try and piece together because these are things where, you know, it's like make your dream routine construction in 2007. And it's yes! these skills that didn't even exist. And then you're connecting them. And then it's actually happened. It's it's wild, but it truly shows, I think, the soundness of her technique and why we need to trust Suni. <laughs> yes, that is the main takeaway. Um, let's talk about regionals. Um, the eight teams who are advancing in order of score are first place, Oklahoma, shocker, second Florida, third place is Cal with a 198.275. LSU comes in fourth, also with a 198.25 in the 198 world. Four teams in 198s. 
Um, Arkansas is fifth. Arkansas, fifth, right behind LSU. Then Alabama coming in with their black murdered out leotards to kill it in their regional. Utah did not have a great meet. Squeaked in, though, with a 197.575. And then Stanford, the heroes of the West Coast with Cal. Stanford. Is Stanford, are they geniuses? Is this, were they just flexing on like strategy? They were like, yeah, we have a 4% admittance rate to our school and we're going to show you by not trying until it counts. Is that what happened? I mean, it's really tough to say. There was definitely some time and some liberties taken on the part of Stanford. (laughs) But when this is the outcome, it's hard to deny and argue like, and it worked. So, I mean, I think, what Stanford has shown is that they are willing to be uncomfortable both in the rankings and probably their performance for a majority of the season and then really turn it on. So I do think it is an an interesting strategy, if that's what you want to call it, but in an NQS era, why wouldn't you do that? I, I mean, it's almost like more teams should maybe try it out. I know. Why go hard from day one when you can stand for it? That's what I'm saying. Um, So we are going to share some of um, Spencer's thoughts that he shared in the outline. We can't claim to obviously be Spencer here, but we're going to try to channel him as much as we can. Um, So the first thing that we wanted to talk about um, that Spencer and I were feel very passionately about is that elimination is fun. Did you feel like these were the most exciting meets because so much was on the line? I did. I actually think I underestimated the excitement slash um, intensity that we were going to see. Um, and really, you know, it it is meant to mirror the beginning. It's, it's the beginning of the NCAA championship. And so many times it's kind of like that was the best team on the day when you know we had super six and you know the outcome was the outcome so i think that this sets that table earlier um maybe not early enough in the season but it's doing it earlier so teams are able to react and respond in in the necessary way um and uh, you know in the words of spencer very few duds in terms of meets that we're watching even the round one meets were chaotic so if that was any indication i would say that trend carried right through i this was i think my favorite thing was that 25 percent of the teams who advanced to the regional final so there's like you know there's the play and meet where it's like the two teams try to just get into regionals as regional then there's the first day of regionals and the final day of regionals where the two winners or not two winners because apparently there's a champion a regional champion and then a sub champion. What's that called? I'm the um, third place gold medalist. Well, how did that fourth, go? Fourth place world champion. Fourth place world some, champion. Some are you. saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, what I loved is that 25% of those who advanced to the regional final were unseated, completely unseated. Penn State, Ohio State, Stanford, ASU. Um, I also love that um, Iowa State and ASU were like Amelia Hudley um, meals at 2016 Olympic trials, like having the her Olympics, like the best time hitting everything. So stoked. Like it was so fun to watch those teams. She was like, nothing to lose. Um, I totally loved it. Um, and I feel like everything was so exciting because like so much was at stake. And this is like, we talked about this a lot on college and cocktails on um, Saturday, but we want the elimination rounds to start earlier. We want, the like blood death match at least I'm going to say eight, eight, we eight weeks. Like let's have six to eight regular season meets. So everyone can have their like, you know, rival at either place, have those meets. And then you have four to six postseason eliminators and make it over a month. So like John Roethlisberger said, April anarchy, but let's start it in March or just push the season to start a little bit later. So it doesn't conflict with the basketballs. That's fine. I'm okay with that. Um, I just feel like it's too much great drama. It's too juicy to stuff it into four days. Like it needs to be extended and like drawn out longer. 
like the finale of a reality show. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, a, a cliffhanger, cliffhanger after cliffhanger uh, to be continued. Uh, the cameras go down, but then the cameras come up. Uh, exactly. I think there's huge potential there um, in terms of, but I think we're basically outlining a strategy that Stanford has, but what in this new world that you're describing, that strategy then goes away because it's like, well, then you have to completely shift everything up. And so I do think in terms of peaking and maybe, you know, regionals also serves as kind of like a, a shake or a wake up call for some programs that we'll get into to where it's like, we've got to do something different. Like as much as you want to stay in your bubble, do what you do every day in the gym, yada, yada. There has to be a level of competition and a new kind of like mindset that kicks in. And I think a lot of the upsets that we saw, some of the upsets that we saw were just that lack of like, who's kicking into this like undeniable competitive state. And that's reflecting back on the teams that we have. Uh, I think the teams that have made it to the national championship are correct. The results mm, close um, some, some asterisks, but at the end of the day, the correct teams made it because of their performance. And a lot of those teams who squeaked in or maybe were surprises were completely undeniable. It was just like you felt that energy, that momentum going that way, and they used that, they capitalized on it, and it was it was super fun to watch. I do, I will say, and I agree with Spencer's point. You know, when this becomes the nine eight is the minimum awarded score if you don't fall, it it loses a bit of momentum in that way. And obviously, we're not speaking in absolutes here, but it's just kind of like. If you're hitting and it's a third or fourth rotation, all of a sudden it's like nine nine. Why wouldn't we? Um, and so I think you lose a lot of that parity quickly when some of those shortcomings of routine construction technique are still there. So it's kind of like, wait, we've been watching this routine go nine eight two five all season long, and it's like all of a sudden it becomes nine nine two five nine nine five. Things that make you think. Yep. Um, so obviously loaded regionals are loaded, um, with drama and, uh, confusion to some extent. To your point, um, I, this is what I felt like there was some tighter scoring, but not tight enough because they're not using all the numbers, especially in like the Gainesville regional, like the final with Utah and MSU. Uh, I was like, mm, what is happening right now? But yeah, not using all the numbers like BYU and Boise tied. So, and then there was a tiebreaker. So, which took 700 years, which was that your, no, that wasn't your, your regional that you commentated. Yeah. It was painful. They went to so many commercial breaks waiting for them to do the basic math of count all the six scores and put it together. And that's how you break the first tie. Well, and this with the play-ins, I think is a little bit different because, um, ESPN was using kind of like local production or school side production for the play in meets. So they weren't really in control of, you know, in terms of there's a producer saying like, we got to wait, we got to hold it, you know, it's not announced. So I can empathize with, you know, there being a lack of clarity in terms of you want basically the teams to know first and then kind of like the public or simultaneously uh, in that way. In my regional, it was like those scores weren't official because very smartly, um, they take down all of the live scoring in the arena. So no screens will show. So I was referencing a third computer screen to see what actually had happened because my regional was decided by 0.25, you know, a quarter, 0.025, quarter of a tenth, my play in me, I should say. Um, and you just don't want to be that kind of like facilitator of like, here's the news because it's not really your news to share at that point yet. Um, so you want everything to be signed and squared away, but I can't imagine that tiebreak situation. Also the tiebreak procedures, we've had multiple in the last, you know, some years. So everybody, you know, we're familiar. Like you have the same score. The, the yeah. meat, uh, yeah, the, the meat officials should know how to do the math real quick and have that. They should already have it done, the just-in-case math. You have the okay math and then the just-in-case and then the second just-in-case math. Um, yeah, I um, I asked an AI 
what the likelihood would be of a sport like gymnastics that's judged to so two teams doing this number of routines uh which that goes down to the tenth of a point that's how it scores what is the likelihood that there would be a tie because it just seemed in it seems insane and it's to goes to like use all the numbers you're not using all the deductions you could so the AI said it, it was too hard and it had to run a bunch of scenarios. And I was like, okay, so what is a metaphor for how likely is this kind of scoring to end up with a tie? And it said, it's like picking a specific atom out of the entire ocean. That's how unlikely it is to have a tie in, uh, in a sport that scored down to the 10th of a point out of a 10. Well, we've had two, I mean... We've that was the two only one. in the last two years. Yes. Oh, I have balloons. Is that... <laughs> you have balloons. I noticed that too when, for our visual listeners, balloons just went up in the air for um for Evan. And I'm because... not happy about it. Don't <laughs> let those balloons fool you. Club Gym Nerd, you get discounts and first dibs on live show tickets, an extra whole podcast every week, athlete dossiers for major competitions, code guides, options to commission your own segments it also makes a great gift check it out at gymcastic.com at the join the club tab but anyway let's talk about upsets because let's talk about the biggest biggest upsets because there are many upsets that we'll get to especially with individuals who matter but anyway host arkansas they were number 12 they defeated kentucky who was ranked seventh so arkansas made it to nationals by beating kentucky arkansas Second highest score ever, a 197.825, not too shabby. Kentucky, three big wobbles on beam. And I think, like, Kentucky, it just, like, they, it just, I just felt like there were a lot of nerves for them. And for for Arkansas, I was so impressed because I, I had to look up, like, when, how long has Arkansas even been around? They only started a team there in 2003. So, and they've only been to uh, NCAAs twice. Before, so this is only their third trip. So the last time they made it, Jordan Weber was in London winning a gold medal. That's how long it's been since they made it to NCAAs. So it's kind of a big deal for them. There you have it. Yeah, I mean, Arkansas has definitely been on a, a wild ride. You know, kind of like one of those programs that is starting from the ground up. And you kind of see those early athletes, Casey Joe McGee, um, I think uh, Emily Peacock, you know, those really early ones who start to set themselves apart. Um, and then the teams gain momentum. And then you have like Jamie Paisani and Catherine Grable. And you have these greats oh, who are just, you know, this, this program that was at one point in the recent past, nothing. And then they are standing on such like amazing athletes. And I think obviously with the transition to Jordan, you know, there's been, you know, ebbs and flows in terms of when they're able to deliver, when they're not. Um, however, I just go back to that word that I use off the top. Like they were undeniable and they used the setting to their advantage. I do not think that there was home scoring um, because Man. at the end of the day, I think they were the team that deserved to qualify. And it was close enough to where it was like, OK, it's not. That I'll, you know, there's no contest here. Um, and yeah, I mean, I will ride for Kentucky all day long. I uh, predicted that they would make it out of this. I think they definitely have the personnel, the development of their younger athletes, specifically their freshmen. Like they have freshmen in lineups that they rely on to set up the, the latter parts of the lineups. And I think the unfortunate thing here is that uh, in my perspective, looking back on it, um, Kentucky probably peaked a little bit early this year, and the postseason unfortunately just seemed like a, a slight decline. And when you have athletes like Isabella Magnelli, Raina Worley, Bailey Bunn, um, you know, really seasoned veteran athletes who deliver week after week after week, and then it's kind of like uh, the you know the couple times that they have shortcomings um it has to be in this situation so it's super unfortunate and i think beam tightened them up and that just kind of created a chain reaction to their last couple events um yeah to where you know i was like if they stick every vault it could be interesting 
but when they didn't, you know, it's like the the deductions were there and they were short, and it just it just got out of hand kind of quick after Beam, which is unfortunate for them. Yeah, yeah, and I've always been like, I don't know, there's something about training just the gymnastics and not training beyond. I feel like in college you have to train beyond. Does that make sense? Like it's not just. It has to be so automatic and you have to train for pressure so much, but it has to be more than what you did in club. It has to be like different way. I don't know if I'm describing that. You as an NCAA champion may understand this better than I do, but handling the pressure. But um, I just feel like there's always a point that Kentucky just gets stuck um, by just training the gymnastics. I don't know how to describe that better, but. I mean, they have the capability. They've made it to nationals before. So, um, you know, last year. So I think it was there. And almost sometimes it's like when that dream becomes a reality and then you carry that momentum into the season, you're performing really well, you're delivering high scores, you have individuals who are shattering records. Um, you know, I guess like, staying in that moment it's going to get real woo woo real quick here uh like staying in that moment almost becomes like too much to anticipate and then um yeah maybe just some some doubt creeps in but you can't chalk it up to like lack of technique or preparation because the athletes who did have you know those visible errors and it, it wasn't just those athletes because of course there there are errors across the board um for all teams but uh yeah it just it was Unfortunate that this was the day. I mean, I think to your point, this just shows how hard this is. It is really, really hard to do the kind of thing that like Alabama and Georgia and Utah and UCLA and Oklahoma have done year after year after year. When you get to a point where you see Michigan won a national championship, it's first one. And then Penn State, who was ranked 25th, eliminated number 11 Michigan by two tenths. Um, they countered a fall on beam in the final rotation. It's the second time in a row that they have missed nationals. Their worst fin finish since 1992. And I just want to ask you as an alum of Michigan, how are you doing with this? Not great, <laughs> but I think, you know, Spencer mentioned this in his, in his feedback in the outline, Michigan has created these amazing classes around all arounders. So you have high school and Wojciech from last year who we were replacing. And then it was kind of like, guess what? Gabby Wilson and Sarah Brooks, like we're going to rely on you even more than we already did as, you know, basically all arounders every meet in addition to those two all arounders. Um, and then peppering in basically just, you know, those very capable specialists in these lineups. Um, I don't think that the other portions of Michigan's lineup have been road tested uh, in these situations. And, you know, it is what it is. Um, you can't fall. And I think just keeping it simple and it's kind of like in this situation, they still made it close counting a fall. So it wasn't like the capability yeah. wasn't there. However, I think it's just unacceptable, uh, you know, in a regional situation, it's like, you can't, you can't fall on these things and, and expect the, out expect the outcome to be different, no matter if you're at home or not. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I'm thrilled for um, the individuals who we'll get into later um, going, but it's, it's disappointing. And I think that Michigan does kind of stand a, a bit of an impasse towards like, where does the team go from here like this? What what large changes can you make? Because when you look at the numbers, which are, in my mind, very simple, worst finish since 92, and two years in a row not making nationals, um, you know, I, I think there needs to be a shift. And we'll wait and see what that might be. I think this is, I guess, what I mean about like with Kentucky and just being about gymnastics and not being about the bigger picture, because the difference between all these teams, like some have built in deductions, they're not going to get the best scores. Um, but a team like Michigan is doing great. They don't have built in deductions. 
at some point it's just about handling the pressure and that's the next level between like you think about, I mean, I keep thinking about Oklahoma, how they've done this year after year after year and Florida, let's not forget Florida um, when they won so many times in a row, how much pressure that is to be a team that won. And then you stick around because your team won and you want to do it again. And then you stick around again because you have a COVID year and you want to do it one more time. And how that pre- handling that kind of pressure is a different kind of pressure than we just made it here. We have nothing to lose. Then this is now the expectation for the whole team and everyone who comes here in the future. It's very different. So speaking of that, let's talk about Arizona. Um, hold, hold on. Hold on. Just one second yes. to back up just to keep everybody honest. So some of Michigan's routines don't have built in deductions. Others True. of Michigan's routines right now do so i do think that they are working a bit differently in previous years for sure it was kind of like that nine nine standard off the bat and we can go we're not living in that reality anymore and so i think you need to make adjustments accordingly to where it's like here's what we're capable of and here's how we can craft and curate our strategy our lineups to accommodate that sorry to take the momentum away arizona state Yes, who you want to talk about. Yes, Yes. not Arizona, Arizona State. Um, Yes, the Sun Devils. Um, They were ranked number 22. They eliminated number nine, UCLA. Um, UCLA was in first after the first rotation floor. They killed it. They had three people in a row, got 995 on floor. Um, And then all the nine sevens on bars and beam. And uh, they had some weird things go on 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 beam that were uncharacteristic um ucla's worst finish since 2006 they didn't even make the regional final they didn't even make it to day two it wasn't like they lost a tie break or they made it and then they had a they didn't even make it to day two this is what kills selena harris looked like she wanted to kill everyone and i could totally understand that um also i think that showed a little team cohesion problems on the UCLA team. But um, that's not to say she isn't justified to being super pissed too, because she did a great job. Um, But yeah. I think think this illuminates something that I think is uh, not specific to UCLA for sure, maybe specific to gymnastics and maybe in like other arenas of life is, you know, the people who are content to be like, we did, we went out there, we tried, you know, we tried. And again, don't mince my words. I'm not saying that anyone in any regional situation is content with their going out there and try, but it's almost an avoidance to lean into the pressure and be like, and we have to hit because the number 22 team is sitting there waiting. Penn State is sitting there waiting to hit their routines. They're not going to score traditionally as high as us, but they're waiting there for us to make a mistake. And so I think where it gets complex for me is it seems like there's an avoidance to lean in to that aspect of the competition and say, it is very real that if we make mistakes, we we will be completely vulnerable and there's a great chance that we may not make it. Um, And that's just a, you know, an observation that I can't help but think, you know, in the grand scheme of gymnastics, when we hear day after day, all we have to do is what we what we do in the gym. Actually, we probably have to do a little bit more these days. Like you definitely have to hit routines, that's undeniable, but you have to be able to adjust. And those are, I think, in that kind of like training mindset or kind of like replicating, how do you how do you train for these moments? And I think it is a mindset thing. You can't prepare physically for these situations. Um, If anything, you know, you have to be ready and say, like, what are you going to do when you're down and out? Um, And, you know, and then we'll see when it actually happens. It's almost like someone should have told Tom Forster that before the Tokyo Olympics. (laughs) Whew, there are many there are many examples. I mean, <laughs> UCLA had moments of greatness, but it's it's those tents that chip away and you know, nine sub nine eighting yourself is it's this is you know the unfortunate outcome of that. And I you know, we saw some some doubt creep in specifically on beam. 
Um, and yeah, but the other thing is, is that I think they're they're trying to fill gaps similarly to Michigan's lineup where they have large spaces that they have been able to fill in previous years um, that are more vulnerable um, based on the gymnastics that they're putting in those slots. I mean, I love Emma Andres so much and I love her gymnastics. I'm so glad she's in the lineup. But when she rolled her ankle doing choreo and the first rotation, I was like, no, who didn't tape her ankle tight enough? Anyway, that was like, it was the bad omen. I was like, no, 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 this. Yeah. Um, okay. Then Evan Stanford, number 19, Stanford really the the heroes they've emerged the heroes of this whole regional weekend to me like they have just showed up eliminated auburn number 14 in the semifinal um this is the second time in a row that uh auburn hasn't made it basically last year remember when suny was not she could got sick kidney stuff couldn't compete was at regionals but then auburn didn't make it um they got like they were just killed almost a whole tenth. They lost their spot to Stanford by. Um, and Stanford, their vault and floor was just their stick after stick, landing after landing. Um, and then Auburn, it was like first up, um, brush went up, and she's like so consistent. She fell three times, three times, she fell three times to finger dislocation. It looked like they had to take her out, tape her fingers up. Um, so I hope she's okay because that's a really terrible thing to go out in a meet when you're that good and you're that consistent to go out that way. But then this is the other thing that happened before we talk about Stanford. She they put up an eight something for her score, and I was like, excuse me, you can't get an eight something on a score with three falls and basically four skills. Like, uh, what is happening right now? So and the judges were probably like, this is the lowest score I've ever given. <laughs> It's college. We're, we can't yeah. get this low. So yeah. I think it should have been in the high sixes. It ended up being a seven because the wrong score was put up and then they corrected it. But I, at first I was just like, oh, this is the biggest corrupt or correct we've ever seen. If someone gets an eight, five for a three fall, four skill routine. Um, anywho, let's go back to Stanford. Absolutely killing it. Um, is there anything left to say about Stanford except Tabitha Yim is a genius? I mean, Chloe Whitner? The, the energy that Tabitha carries as a coach is palpable. Like, she gets competition. You can tell, even being in a space with her, that she wants to win. Regardless of what her team is, you know, the skills they're performing, the lineups they're putting up. She's like, I mean, we saw, you know, back in 02, 03, when she's just like, you know, <laughs> she's down. She is down to compete yes. and to win and to do her absolute best. And I think that's what translates into these like postseason moments, um, more so regionals um, for Stanford. And yeah. They were also undeniable in the semifinal and as we'll get into later, um, the final. I think it's no wonder that Tabitha Yim uh, and her brother are both this level of coach because from the time Tabitha was little, she has had that like, I'm here to compete swagger that um, in, in her gymnastics, sometimes it bothered me because it was so strong that I think it spread to the whole Stanford team. Like as an aesthetic in her routines, I didn't love it, but I've always loved her demeanor as a coach. And she's just very different in that way than most other gymnastics coaches. And um, I, I feel like I have been waiting for this moment since Tabby took over. And did you see when... Uh, Liz from Cal and Tabby from Stanford ran to each other after the meet was over to congratulate each other. Yes. I mean, you know, the, the dissolution of the Pac-12 and just like the Bay Area camaraderie, it was like, it was pretty magical in that moment, especially to do it in that fashion and Cal coming off of, you know, a subpar performance at Pac-12s and trying to rebound at home and having that pressure at home to, you know, even have a chance to vie for that national title. And I think Stanford conversely 
was just like were like balls to the wall just going for it and so it was this you know these two very different paths that led to the same space and an embrace together and that energy um you know i think it's very evident um that most coaches but especially Liz and Tabitha have a passion for gymnastics and what they do and they take it very seriously and they expect the level of you know achievement that they received and so I think you know again when those moments happen there's a ton of gravity that comes behind it um it was it was wild yeah um I also love to see schools that are this hard to do school also make it to this level because it always kills me that the men at Stanford have won and the cow men have won and the women haven't. I'm like, you guys, we can't have this. We need both the women to win championships too. Um, but to, to the, to that end, to things that I would like people to aspire to, um, there was a lot of athletes talking to the camera. I love you, mom stuff, stuff, that kind of thing. And I was like, you know, I would really like to know what Evan would like athletes to say into the camera. Like, what are the, cra I have some things in mind. I can give you my thoughts first and then, you know, let you know, but I would really like to see someone say like, I have a 3.9 GPA and I'm looking for an internship in Bali or something in the AI space. Like either one's fine. I'll do it. Or like, be like, um, I don't have an NIL deal. Look how much money I could be making you. I'm on TV right now. Like these are the kind of things that I would like to hear athletes say. I mean, we had Le Corsier get caught on camera saying, let's fucking go after she stuck her landing um, for uh, Alabama. And so, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's push the narrative to a, different, I, a little different space. I love that energy. You know, I think in the era of NIL, the era of social media, um, you know, you're always, I found myself almost surprised when gymnasts have personalities that they're able to project beyond their sport. Because for so long, it was, uh, again, that very buttoned up, like, we're here to do our job, we're here to work hard, we're doing it in our bubble as sisters forever and ever, amen. <laughs> and when you can get a little disruption in that space, and somebody who's willing to be respectful, um, but a little bit, you know, have some swag with it you know, say like, I am the shit and I know it and I'm going to, you know, back it up. Who who doesn't want to see that? Um, and I think as women's sports continue to gain traction and momentum being shown, first of all, um, you know, we need those personalities. We need those athletes who are able to speak, have a perspective, have a personality. And, you know, I'm not asking anyone to be inauthentic or kind of, you know, step outside their comfort zone, but you need personalities to drive the sport. You need people who are going to back it up. And, you know, Caitlin Clark, I think, you know, she. That's a basketball being, player who's really yes, good at college. Yes. And now she's going to the WNBA. She's very, very topical, is not afraid to speak about her individual accolades will also pump up her teammates by name and say, you know, this person did great things. This person did great things. So I think it's almost that shift of in gymnastics. We, a lot of times feel like the coach can only talk about athletes and we need the athletes to be able to talk about themselves and each other and other teams as well. You see a ton of back and forth, you know, between club teammates or national team members where it's like, that's my girl. And I was like, I didn't know they were friends. I want to know more about that. Like, what did you, what did you guys, what do you guys talk about? How do you, how often do you hang out? Like, those are the stories that I think drive a narrative in the sport outside of the competition, which is super interesting and is an, feels like an opportunity um, where, where that can, you know, maybe grow a little bit. And Caitlin Clark to, to talk about her because I think this is important and it plays into why gymnastics is stuck in the past with the way regionals are shown, whereas basketball, everybody knows they're going to make a ton of money on this. So it's stretched out after a whole month and gymnastics is still squeezed into a weekend or five days, Wednesday to uh, Sunday, when it could be stretched out and it could benefit everyone. And Caitlin Clark brought up this week, wasn't it like 87 
billion. What was the mark? 87 million people watched the basketball or something. You know, it's something huge. The women's basketball, 18 million. You know, you guys, you know how I am with the numbers. Spencer's not here. Uh, thank you. But uh, Caitlin Clark made a point of saying, like, this helps all women's sports. Like, honestly, I don't follow. I could care less about the ball sports. You've met me, Evan. But I have followed the women's basketball because it's like there's so much stuff happening. There's so much drama. And it's like all over the I find it really interesting, like what's going on with these people and that people in the history and who went like made a gesture to someone's face and then they beat them later and all of the stuff. Um and I feel like that's good for everybody. And it's like to the point where we were at Easter at my um, brother-in-law's house and they turned on basketball and it was men's. And I was like, wait, why? You guys know the women's is like way more interesting than this because I knew all the backstory. I was like, so-and-so and she pulled hair and she knocked her so-and-so over. And this, anyway, you guys, there's a lot more. Men, men only had 14 million. Oh, and the women's basketball peaked at 27 million. That's very embarrassing for the men. See, everyone watches women's sports and it's the future, by the way. So ESPN, let's talk about your coverage and extending and changing um, how regionals go. Speaking of ESPN coverage, my biggest gripe is still, there's a lot of things I love. I love that we actually get to watch regionals. Remember the days when we couldn't watch regionals, Evan? We literally or couldn't watch it regionals. was like some when a certain certain schools would host regionals and it's like, well, they don't have the capability to show it. So they, that one just won't be shown. And you're like, okay, all right, <laughs> there you have it. You know, there was no, there was no standard. It was just kind of like, oh, if you had the ability to stream it, of course you would, but that wasn't considered back in the day. And yeah, it's as with so many meets in, in gymnastics and growing up through the nineties and early two thousands, it was like so many things were a mystery and you were like, what? did happen there. Um, and it was, you know, you relied on the people in the stands recording and then, you know, the advent of YouTube to kind of find it come out of the woodwork. So to give ESPN some props, it has, we're already going leaps and bounds. And I think, you know, what we as gymnastics fans are just seeing the opportunity that continues to be there. You're like, if you think this is good, it could be so much better. Like it, yeah. It's our, and it's already there. You don't even have to do much. Right. Um, it's just showing and formatting in a little different way. Yep. And I really like that we got to see every routine. And I like that there's two routines at a time now. And I like that they had all the scores up huge. Like the score should obviously be on the bottom instead of that. That's Evan hydrating because he did Sorry. his CrossFit today. Just so you know, you guys. But um, uh, But I feel like the score should be on the bottom. And then the, the you know screens, the two gymnasts on the screens could be bigger. Um, that's the one thing that I would fix. But also it was super, as always, I'm like, there are other people trying to win a national championship for their school. They're their whole school's hope. These individuals, their scores also matter because they could be the one that qualifies and takes out some of these other people. So let's also put their scores up. That's the one thing that is still missing and i know it's like team 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 and team 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 and that's how you win wars and so that's why we're so big on it and it, it's important you know um but i wish that we had that um also i just want to give a shout out to kathy johnson for being a hero for saying quote this is not a ta jesus take the wheel moment that was the great one of the greatest moments she's like no you have to do it right now and step up and that's what we've been talking about like you can't just be like just do it like i do at home no because you're gonna have nerves you have to control all of that right now and do what you're capable of i love that moment for her um i also love that espn was able to inform to afford an enya for karina muñoz's name the ncaa still hasn't fixed her name it's still spelled wrong and has no Enya on the NCAA.com page where they announced the individuals who qualified to regionals. So shout out to ESPN for buying an Enya. Um, and <laughs> also, I love that um, when Kathy did her final sign off, uh, Bart said that she was being given a, uh, <clears throat> that Kathy, his lovely bride, or Kathy, his bride, Nadia, his bride, um, had given her a perfect 10 for her career that Kathy said, Oh my God, it's my first one, which was so adorable. So any insights you can give um, from your perspective as a big time ESPN commentator? 
I mean, Jessica, you you spoil me with the accolades that you append to my name, but as a very vocal non-contributor to my national championship team, and as a very digital only non-produced commentator, I do have some insights, but they come with a, a very specific brand of perspective because I'm not held to those major broadcast standards that I know you are, you're playing in a box and you are dealt certain cards that you can play and you have to, you know, do what you will with the hand that you're dealt. So I totally recognize and understand that sometimes the commentary we're hearing is because of those limitations. Uh, You did math on your own with the hand that you were dealt. I was very impressed by that. Doing your own math. It's a uh, it's a one man show, and again, by my own doing, I like it like that. But when you again are like, here's the reality of what we're faced with. I've got to figure it out. Um, and Verdius also helps in in oh, Verdius the is amazing. Yes, yeah, um, we appreciate that. Um, I think a couple notes. So the tower totally agree. We can just bring the tower down and. Um, have it have it on the bottom. I do think with the advent of the tower, they're kind of like, how can we templatize and plug things in? We've seen this when like lineup changes changes happen. Like the tower isn't great at real time stuff. So I think that is also indicative of like people on the back end on production are still getting used to what this actually means in a very controlled environment. So we are not, you know, it's not like they're plugging in, uh, you know, everybody's name as they're getting the lineups in. Everything is kind of like the best, you know, you know, most time uh, appropriate uh, perspective. But these things aren't changing. So when we have individuals come in, it's like, well, what if there's an individual on bars and then an all arounder? So you have two slots or one slot. I can see where it just becomes a nightmare in terms of this, but we have this template and we know that there are going to be six slots for each team. You know, those other pieces don't fit yet. I do think that there is opportunity in terms of dynamic updates. And I think we're scratching the surface with like the grayed out score. Somebody's doing some like Excel sheet magic where they're like, and the lowest score of these six will automatically be grayed out, no matter if there's two scores there. Um, so I think there's potential, but you need a very savvy gymnastics mind to understand how that works. And I think that marriage of production and gymnastics savvy is super rare. And I'm just not sure it's available at this point, but I think the foundation is good some minor tweaks to get us to an even better place. And then, you know, remember when we got the protractor for the first time and the, you know, the leap meter. So like, it's there. It just takes time. So we'll see. I was very happy that they, the Verdius was our supplier of scores everywhere because I like to see the breakdown from all the judges and I could just go to the rotation, little click on rotation two, go to the event, drop down everyone who competed and then boop, see all the judges scores. And that is my favorite. So, um, all right, let's talk about individual qualifiers. Obviously the most important thing, um, to me personally. And I want to know from you, what are your injustices and your justices from these regionals? So for Michigan, the qualifiers to NCAs are Gabby Wilson, Vault is the all round Vault. We have CR Brooks bars. We have Bauman, um, beam herring from Penn state and then floor again, Brooks. It's basically a Michigan a thon of individuals who made it not a surprise. Um, Evan, what are your injustices or justices? I mean, justices, if we're not going to have Michigan as a team, then I want Michigan as individuals. And I think we're seeing that across the board here. Um, I think, you know, Carly Bauman is, has perfected her uneven bars routine. And I think we see that, um, especially, obviously, when she sticks the dismount. Um, it's just a great display. Um, Amani Herring's a great story from Penn State you know, to where it's like, hit your routine to the best of your ability and see what happens. And you qualify to nationals. Like I don't, I wouldn't have gone into those regionals 
with her name on the tip of my tongue for an individual balance beam qualifier, but become undeniable. And that's, that's where it takes you. And, you know, I could laugh, cry and everything in between around Gabby Wilson and Sierra Brooks and what they mean and have done for Michigan gymnastics. So I think it'll be a, a nice send off for them. Um, I think they're in the, the second, uh, the second session, um, Gabby with Oklahoma. So, you know, hopefully there'll be some good momentum behind them, but I think, I think these individual qualifiers are a great makeup. If I had to say injustice, it would be Ava Piedrahita from Penn state. And she didn't stick this, um, on this in the second round when she needed to, but, um, she does the Omelian chick, uh, the half on Pike front off, but on, on finals in Ann Arbor, she absolutely stuck at cold and judges just hate when she sticks this and insist on taking deductions every single time. Um, but she does it multiple times per year. I get it. It could be a little bit crisper, but just at the end of the day, I find, I find it so hard to take away. So I would have loved to see that vault one day earlier, uh, and Ava, um, and Sierra, let's say, um, qualifying on vault. I know that's not possible, so don't come for me. What about you, Jess? You are muted. Sorry, I was muted because I'm trying not to cough wildly into um, the <laughs> into the microphone. Um, for me, I don't have any very super massively strong feelings about this one. Um, it that I wasn't. Uh, yeah, for me, I'm. It was really nice for me that the justice of this being a Michiganathon, because like especially Sierra Brooks has been so and Gabby Wilson is so important. And so that they stayed and are still there and are these leaders for the team made it is really nice. Um, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm sad that I'm not going to see Sierra Brooks full twisting double layout dismount um, again, cause she only qualified for floor. Maybe she'll do it on floor. Ah, oh, don't tease me. Evan, <laughs> stop it. Oh my God. That'd be so exciting. And that brings me to, um, Arkansas, the qualifiers are Jade Carey, Olympic champion on floor, who does have a full twisting double layout in her routine, is going for all around from Oregon State. Vault Maya Hooten, not floor, but vault Maya Hooten's going. Um, bars Courtney Blackson, um, who is known for her floor, I feel like, but isn't going on bars. And then um, Minnelli from Kentucky. And then floor, Raina Worley, of course, duh. Uh, Raina Worley and her perfect landings. Um, Evan, did you have strong feelings either way, justice or injustice? Justice, I feel I feel really content with with these qualifiers as well. Um, you know, Maya Hooten, I think what she means to not only Minnesota, but to the Big Ten and to the NCAA in general, just in terms of and, and that's I think she's a great example of that competitive mindset where it's like she's like, I'm gonna stick this full in. I know I don't have to, but I'm going to try my best to absolutely two foot stick this. And I'm going to do that for all three of my passes. So I think that she exemplifies that mentality that I think permeates and just creates an energy around her. Um, so super happy that she's qualified, obviously would want it to be in a somewhat different capacity on multiple events, but it is what it is. Um, Courtney Blackson, I, I'm not as versed in the background here, but I know that she was dealing with an injury and does a beautiful bar set with a Markalov, sticks to the dismount, is, you know, basically crying upon landing, which who, you know, uh, name a better gymnastics, like uh, a yeah. series of events. Um, and, you know, has qualified as an individual before, probably was like, I don't think it's gonna happen. And then, you know, all of these stars aligned for this to be the outcome. So I think, you know, again, you hope that her injury is manageable enough to get her to Fort Worth and healthy and able to display kind of like her best, uh, her best possible. Um, so yeah, a feel good one there. And then Kentucky just have to continue giving props there. You know, these leaders, Magnelli and Worley, um, they've delivered so many times and made so many current Kentucky athletes, past Kentucky athletes, and probably future Kentucky athletes believe that new things are possible 
um, when you're a Kentucky gymnast. And I think that speaks volumes to, um, yeah, just what they've contributed to the program. So I think this will be a send off that we've got to see Raina Worley, same mindset as well. Um, you know, for, for the errors that, you know, inevitably we all make that she unfortunately had at regionals, um, you know, went right back on floor and was like, I'm going to stick this. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to step back into this controlled lunge and then I'm going to continue on. So we've seen it so many times with her and I, uh, I just love it. And yeah. I'm excited to see it one more time. My injustice for the Arkansas regional was, uh, Kendall Whitman from George Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, not in her, uh, double front, not making it on floor because it's a stupid out of the, the freaking out of bounds lines. So they can't handle her. Her routine is so too fantastic for those stupid white lines. Get out of her way. She only got a nine seven. Ah, anyway, I mean, I'm not saying that like she absolutely deserved to go because of that routine, but I'm just saying like if we're going to do things like break ties with NQSs, then you should give her an NQS. We didn't see that out of bounds and something else, and let her go because her floor routine is my favorite. It's so good. So that's my injustice. Gainesville. So we had. Uh, we have for Georgia, Lily Baby Nastia Smith going. Very impressive. Georgia was one of the teams that honestly like impressed me the most. Where I was like, oh, is Suzanne Spirit here with this team? It's like uh, they were like competing and they were pissed and like crying when they didn't make it. And I was like, aha, this is the kind of attitude you want from a team who's going to make a difference and start winning championships again, to quote Courtney Capetz. Um, Silverman from Maryland made it for vault. Um, Mara Tetrasole um, of the Netherlands and Missouri now made it for bars. And um, Smith, Nikki Smith from MSU for beam and Skyla Schulte of Skyla Schulte and artistry on floor for MSU made it on floor. Did you have any injustices? I mean, it's unfortunate what happened to you. Mizzou and MSU, I think in general, this is not an individual injustice. So I'm going to, I'm going to rewind it back a little bit. Um, but, you know, Mizzou started so strong. And then I think just, you know, it just didn't, it didn't happen that day for them. Uh, and it is unfortunate um, that they had this day on the one that, really counted and mattered. I think everybody saw the potential there, but when you're stepping on bars dismounts and falling on beam, you know, it just, it can't be there every day. And unfortunately, this is the day that it happened to Mizzou. Um, similarly for Michigan State, I think, I think they felt the weight and they were competing as if they had that weight on them. And I think what we've loved to see with that kind of like meteoric rise of Michigan State is that they were just, you know, able to lock in and compete really free, but really focused. Um, so that kind of striking that balance between like nothing to lose, but we still know that we want to win. Um, and it just, again, you know, you were under rotating yourself to death on, on uneven bars. Um, and then multiple falls on beam. Uh, it, it just, it just can't happen. So super unfortunate, but really glad we're seeing Nikki Smith and Skylar Schulte. I mean, Skylar Schulte probably top five NCAA choreography, um, moments this year for me. Um, and I can give you my other four. Um, yes, please and, go. um, my Lazon Cal. Yeah. Bella Mabanta, Denver. Uh. Um, Kat Lavasser, um, Oklahoma. I really mm -hmm. like that one. I think it's really well suited. And who else do I love? Who else do I love? Brooklyn Morris. Brooklyn Morris. Are you going to say Brooklyn Morris? Is it Brooklyn Morris? I'm not going to say Brooklyn Morris. Honorable mention for sure. Like recognize just the, the, you know, the <laughs> pain of a nation. Is that what you're trying I feel to say? Like it's just like the, the like exoskeleton, you know, she's like emerging, uh, from emotion. Uh, I love Jocelyn Moore. She's actually one of my injustices. Um, you know, I think say what you want about the, you know, she's had some bouncy landings, but I just love the like, like land and look, you know, she's like, she's never looking yeah. forward. And I'm just like, 
I just yeah. love it. It's so different. And it's kind of like, why? And it's really showing that like personality to be like, ID gaff. This is how I'm going to do it. And, you know, welcome. Yes, you're welcome. I am here. This is my example of why you put girls in gymnastics or any sports. So they feel comfortable being like, you're welcome. I'm fucking great. That is why you put girls in sports. Boys get that everywhere, but especially girls in sports. This is why. My um, injustice is Ilka Juke, Iowa, not making it on beam. And like, it's not just like she caught a foot on a dismount. It wasn't, um, she still freaking landed. It was amazing, but on her gainer. But like for me, that beam routine is what beam's supposed to be. It has phrasing, it has rhythm changes. It is all the things that it, like a Brooklyn Moore's floor is, but on beam. And we so rarely see that. It's not one of those routines where people are like, so explain to me gymnastics. Why did they do that like posing in between the acrobatics on beam? You shouldn't, ask, if it's done correctly, you shouldn't ask that question because it all flows and has a purpose and that's how she does beam. And yeah, that's what I love. It's just like, she is the spirit of the code done correctly. So that's what, why I love her. So some people just like to give us no strings attached money. They don't want to bother with joining Club Gym Nerd. And so they just donate. You can find our donate button for a no strings attached donation at the bottom of the club page at gymcastic.com forward slash club. Um, let's talk about the Cal regional and who's going for all around the great University of Washington, Skylar Killa Wilhelm, um, which she's great. We talk about her so much. Um, so I'm so stoked for her. Um, Vault Anaya Smith from ASU. Um, Anaya Smith ASU, right? Yeah, she is. Um, because we're gonna watch her um her vault in a second because I was like, this is what I'm talking about with so not having the thing, the thing with Anaya Smith, maybe yeah, let's watch it now, is that her technique, she's just straight up and down. There's never, there's never any there's never any doubt. She's like, I'm gonna land straight up and down. And if anything, I would like to see her bend her knees maybe a little bit, absorb a little bit. Um, but this technique has worked for her. I think we've seen year over year it's developed into this kind of like technique and when she can she's gotten the repetitions in competition year over year um she's able to land it this way um and that kind of like i would say like technical ballsiness is what makes you undeniable in this setting because there were so many one and a halves at this regional um not i mean not so many but there were multiple um and this one stuck out because um, a, it was, for the most part, stuck. There was a little kind of, you know, bodily bodily reaction. Um, but she was straight up and down. And it just kind of shows that she was really going for it. Got to get props. So I love that point that you're making because I feel like the thing about her that's so different and why it sticks out is because so many people, I see them, they're over-exaggerating their hollow to the point that they have a hip bend, like a legit hip bend. You cannot draw a straight line from their head of their femur down to their knee. There is a bend. Um, and I feel like I see that with a lot with a lot of Oklahoma vaults. And it kills me when they don't get deducted from that. Because I'm like, it's not laid out. They don't have open hips. It's not laid out. And she is totally open the whole time. And the thing is, she's not like when you're talking about how she lands straight up and down and like the competitive ballsiness, as you said. She, what the difference is, she is not doing a full and then looking over her shoulder to just try to land coming in like a goose landing on water into the mat to land that front twist a sun devil landing. landing in the sand <laughs> you know like she is dropping in and that's the difference and that's why her vault is so much better and so much bigger and it's not that there aren't other ones that are this good but this it made me so happy that she qualified because that vault is so good and it's so different. Her technique is different. And she's not just trying to do it and stick. She's doing it so high and with open hips. And it's I so stoked for her. So stoked for her. Um, her teammate, uh, Jada Mangahas, also amazing, made it for bars. Beam, Selena Harris made it for beam. And then on floor, Che Campbell won it. Won it. She won the tiebreaker between three people that had the same score. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But Evan... 
Do you have any other injustices from this regional? I think the injustice that, and to be completely frank, I've been a Denver skeptic most of the year. And it was kind of like, I feel like they were, the rankings just were indicative. I think they have great, unique gymnastics. Just can't can't even look at me right now. Disgusted. Um, But I was just like, oh, I, I, there were some aesthetic things that, that fell short for me. Um, Seeing them in person, uh, you know, obviously Jessica Hutchinson um, chooses the skills that she's competing, if not in, in conjunction with her coaches, but the skills that she does, she knows she can do them perfectly. And I think that speaks volumes. And the other injustice, you know, obviously her beam work, her floor work, even vault, um, you know, a tiny bit of leg separation as she comes onto the table. But in the regional final last rotation for her to stick that one and a half, like that is competition. And I think that Denver's shortcomings were just a few other like losses of momentum in their lineups. They had a few falls on the day. Um, so super bummed that we're not going to be able to see her. I also think the team has great potential, you know, with Madison Ulrich and Mia he- Hebink. Um you know, they are getting their feet underneath them in that competitive uh, in that competitive arena. So, I mean, you just want to see some some Denver representation, um, but it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Jessica, just no. Um, but the real, the real, except Mabanta is the other one for Denver that is my injustice because like her running split leap across the beam, it's not a it's not a switch side half. Not, she just takes up half the beam with the most aggressive split leap anyone has ever done on beam into a switch half it's i love it like so many split leaps are just like i'm adding this here because i'm trying to get credit into something else don't don't bother looking at this her split leap demands your attention evan um and like i (laughs) and pardon me for turning around so i wasn't blowing my nose on the camera i really did care about what you were saying evan but um but brooklyn moore's honestly this is the thing that freaking kills me about the whole way that this um that this regionals is about sudden death you are you are a competitive gymnast career over done like in a second that's how fast it happens but you should always do adult gymnastics or do a pro league after because it's great um but anyway besides that this is the excitement about it right you're at the top of the world never competing again brooklyn moore's which is not the end of her career her floor is so good it's like she's doing another sport it she is just in another category she tied a 995 so there were six 995s at the cal regional three of them came from ucla athletes which i think is a bj Doss. kudos to you for keeping up the art and the um on floor and also the conditioning so people don't hurt themselves and can't compete the rest of the season because they can actually do a last pass when the beginning of the season starts anyway shay campbell nye reed and brooklyn moore's all tie so they're tied. We have a tiebreaker and stupid, not at NCAA finals. We don't have a tiebreaker only at stupid regionals. We have a tiebreaker. So now, so Brooklyn loses the first tiebreaker because they put all the judges scores together and Naya and Shea both got tens from one judge. So Brooklyn is out first problem with the tiebreaker system. First of all, that's my first problem with it. Then um, it goes to the head judge and then NQS. So the thing is, I'm just like, if this is, I do not want to live in a world where Brooklyn Moores loses a tiebreaker because two judges were wrong about two other routines and gave them tens when it should have gone to Brooklyn Moore. That's what I'm saying. I mean, we hear you. We totally hear you. I do think it is interesting that we have had to invoke the NQS tiebreak because why are some athletes' performances good enough on the day and others are then critiqued right. based on a, a collection of days. Um, but I get it. You you never want to get to that point. And, you know, maybe we should look at 
the amount of ties that we have and the likelihood that we will continue to have ties and remedy that in the moment rather than have to create this like trail of breadcrumbs to lead us back to, you know, okay, finally we can break this tie based on, you know, whatever arbitrary uh, thing we're putting in place. I think, you know, the other, I, I talked a lot about competitive mindset and Selena Harris, you touched on it when they unfortunately didn't make it was pissed. Um, or at least that's what she was conveying through the screen to the audience. And I think she's a great example of kind of this new era of UCLA who is still committed to the beauty, the artistry, the development that I think Val laid a, a really evident foundation in. Um, and, but they still have to find their way in, in kind of this new space, um, going through multiple coaching transitions um, and seeing, you know, how do you strike that balance between um, being super fun and bubbly and authentic um, and a competitor, like a down ass B to compete. Um, and I think Selena Harris conveys that. And I think yeah. she is that. Um, and it may just be, you know, a, an adjustment to where, you know, she's still, she's still young on that UCLA team. And I think they're similar to Michigan at an impasse where, there's multiple transitions that they've needed to go through as a team. And now one is possibly like the mindset, like what do you want to adopt? And I think that Selena could be a leader, you know, if it, not to say she's not already, um, but that mindset may be saying like, Hey guys, like I compete like this because I don't want it to end up like this. Um, so I, I think that definitely comes through um, when you see her compete and on screen. Yeah. I also, I just want to state for the record that I'm super stoked for Shay that she is going in my dreams. It would be Brooklyn and Shay would go together to NCAs, but um, Shay has also been through it all at UCLA and has come through um, as with the beautiful integrity that she has in her gymnastics. And, um, but I think one thing I want to, one more thing I want to say about Brooklyn Moores is the difference between her and everyone else is like pornography. You know it when you see it. Her routine is art. And everyone else, most everyone else is doing gymnastics. You just know it's art. It's different. It stands out completely. Um, anyway, in case you wanted me to simplify it that way with you. I... <laughs> And someone texted me that they were like so excited to watch her and their friend was making, actually he's Linders, who was our, the gymnastic uh, bartender official. Um, she texted me, she was so excited and her friend that she took to the meet was laughing at her because she was so excited. And then she did cry, literally watching Brooklyn Moores. Like it's not just me who cries. And her friend was like, oh, I get it now. Now that I've seen it, I'm not making fun of you because now I understand why you cried watching that. This is the difference. It really is a different level of art. Go ahead, Evan. Um, no, I was just going to say, I will continue to think about whatever beautiful <laughs> analogy you laid out. I'm not there, but I I mean, the art is undeniable. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, like I said, I mean, it's like an emergence um, where it's almost like, uh, this dancer's performer spirit is trying to like break through to like some other dimension through Brooklyn during this routine. Yeah, it's, that it's is that. a very that's a very good way to put it. I think. Um, also, gymnastic update. On that note, some things are happening, Evan. Um, so NCA live show VIP tickets. The meet and greet packages are sold out. Um, there's only one, I think, premium ticket left where you get a little gifty poo um, that are very cute this year, just so you know, something new. Um, so, uh, yeah, our secret special guest is coming. It's going to be very excited. So, starting, so get your tickets. You can meet Evan there, um, gymcastic.com. Also, uh, virtual season passes. So, you get four live shows for the price of three live shows, virtual attendance. Um, those are gone. Once this live show at NCAs ha happens on April 19th. So get them for the garden. If you need any help, customer services from castic.com. Also, shout out to our regional fantasy winner, 
the Wolf Kino has won regionals. Congratulations to Wolf Kino. You have won a mini commission. You can make Spencer talk about anything that he is uncomfortable talking about in gymnastics for a full 10 to 15 minutes. That is what you've won. Leotards, colors, feelings in general. These are the things I would suggest. Um, and we'll have a new fantasy game for nationals later this week. Um, I placed an amazing 340th in the regionals um, because I got a zero because someone did not vault who my team was so good. I was like, finally, I'm going to do great. No, I got a zero. It's fine. I'm not upset about it. It's all okay. Uh, Evan. Okay. Corrupt or correct regionals edition. Let us discuss the Gainesville regionals bar situation because we had many, many people upset with many scores, but I want to focus on MSU and MSU versus Utah. Utah, who have never not made it to regionals, ever. To nationals. Nationals, yes. And, and, and regionals. You know, and regionals, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, I'm at, I talk about pressure. Is it more pressure? From, I feel like the pressure's all off once they make it to nationals. But um, so Grace McCallum got a 995 on bars. Um, and I was really surprised by Grace McCallum's 995, not because she did a great routine because she's Grace McCallum, but she had a very, very short handstand. I would say it's between 30 and 40 degrees short of vertical, her handstand, which should be at least uh, a tenth. It's up to three tenths, but um, for that specifically, it should be uh, 1.5 to two tenths. Um so I was like, okay, so she's going to get like, you know, the, the highest at this point. Now she's starting from a nine, eight, uh, nine, eight, five, this routine after I saw how short that handstand was. And then, but then she also flexes her feet on her dismount. And I was like, okay, well they should take something. Cause there's four judges now. So someone should be deducting at least a half a 10th for a flex feet on dismount. Nope. She got a nine, nine, five, nine, nine, five. So I was like, okay, I thought the scores were a little bit tighter. Maybe what's going on? But then I see um, Zermani from MSU goes short on a handstand, not as short as Grace was. And again, this is from the TV angle, not from the judges are sitting. So the judges, you know, have a different angle. This is just from where I'm sitting watching TV. Um, short on a handstand, but not as short as Grace. And then a step on the landing, 975. And I was like, um, what is happening here? I mean, obviously it is MSU's fault because they didn't do their cape intro and they also wore le white leotards, lesson learned. But I think this summed up the general confusion with Utah having counting falls and still scoring so high and MSU just not getting the scores on bars. And again, I wasn't sitting with it where the judges were sitting and that's why we need. Do you have any spe special connection to these? Uh, that you've seen this new company that has like a, I expect you to, you're, you know, in the tech world, Evan. So I expect you to know about these things. It's like a little chip that goes on your eyelid with a camera and it can see exactly what your iris sees. Um, can you hook this up for the judges? Are you working on that secretly in your secret not lab there. at Apple? Not there, not nope. me. Uh, can't, unfortunately. Can't, unfortunately. can't do it. Um, so I think what is more interesting in this story is obviously the lead off of um, McKenna Smith and yes, going over on a handstand, but not jumping off the apparatus, effectively saving them um, from a very precarious position um, and scoring a nine five. So it was like, I think that was accurate and indicative of, of what happened there. Then scores still, you know, built slowly, but Miley O'Keefe in the third or fourth slot had a 9875. And I was like, oh, things are going to be tight today because that routine to me was 99 potential, if not higher than that, based on other regionals, based on other routines we had seen. Um, so I think the jump from Miley to Grace made it even more kind of nonsensical. Um, I don't know the the particular handstand that you're talking about. I do know that Grace 
always flexes her feet on her dismount. So, you know, there is that built-in deduction. And I don't doubt that there could have been, you know, something else there. I think it's just a big jump when there are those visible landings. I think from my perspective, where Zarmani opened it was being short on the dismount as well yeah. as the step. So the under rotation and a step forward, um, you know, it's kind of like the double whammy of um, deductions. And, you know, it's it's hard to quantify exactly, but I think in regional settings and situations when the judges are like, we will give you a 995. We are ready to give everyone a 995. And then you give any indication, a short landing, a step, you know, they're kind of like, well, two things like, then we're going to, you know, they just become much more liberal with their deductions at that point. Um, so I think it is kind of like some inside baseball of, of judging and trying to understand why that's happening. Um, I, again, given that this didn't affect the overall results in my perspective, um, the overall qualifiers, um, you know, let's say somewhere in between. I, I do. I <laughs> Somewhere between corrupt or correct. I do think it is encouraging with the scores that there were no teams who didn't make it who scored higher than teams who did make it. So there was no one in a regional who didn't place in the regional final first or second who had a higher score than someone in another regional who advanced. So because we have had that happen in the past. So I think that the easy regionals. The easy regionals, right? We have had that happen. And so that, I think, was encouraging overall. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a little bit of elite news. And so we had the uh, selection camp, um, the one there was a lot of hubbub about because Gabby uh, Douglas was not invited because she didn't compete at, uh, she didn't meet the criteria and she didn't compete at, um, at Winter Cup. And uh, But the big thing that came out of that, the major news, is that Trinity Thomas made a team is back on national team and is going to Pacific Rims at the end of April. So shout out to Trinity Thomas. Um, <laughs> Evan is snapping in case you couldn't hear that. Oh um, yeah. Also we got the British, <laughs> the British Euros team. Um, so along with Kinsella on Dean Ruby Evans and her Aminar and Georgia May Fenton and her bars, we have one Becky Downey. MBE, who has made yet another European Championship team her 10th European Championship team. Huge congratulations to her and to all of the women who are competing there for the British. Um, the other thing I just want to note is that the, I don't know what you would call it, um, Evan, but like, you know what you call what happens in the Olympic weir year where suddenly parents freak out and ship their, their kids all over the country to try to make an Olympic team four months before the Olympics? Do we have a name for that yet? Um, uh, we don't. Uh, but it's it's somewhere in a psychology book uh, to be <laughs> to be diagnosed. I mean, obviously, let's let's assume positive intent and yes. you know just the dream dream maker syndrome. Let's say uh, you know the family dream. It's all of ours. It's yes, all of our dreams. It is. Yeah. Of course. And maybe there is a reason it was, you know, time. There's some things happening at that gym. But you know, this is a thing that we see at this time of year in Olympic year. Risa Sponda now listed it at a, as a world champion um gymnast. So she's at Simone's gym now. And then Tyler Turner has moved to the Yevgeny Woga. In gym internet news, Evan, how excited are you that? Nemoff isn't the only one with a gymnastics show anymore. Horkina now has her own gymnastics show, Horkina Show. And one of the pictures that she put up with him from the show features super villain rhythmic coach Irina Viner looking out over a balcony for her next rhythmic gymnastics victim. Um, what kind of amazingness can we expect from the Horkina Show? What are your hopes and dreams? I mean, I 
is it marketed as a one woman show? <laughs> because <laughs> I think we can we can safely assume maybe it's just her, you know, playing playing some of the, the classics and uh, you know, remixing what she, you know, knows she's good at. Um, I also think there's something there's something to be it. I see the name and I'm like, I want it to be like Shorkina. Like uh I want it to be like a you know a, a branded moment, but show Horkina is you know that's just a lot of linguistic inflections that you know don't quite make sense. Maybe in Russian though it uh it it flows a bit a bit smoother. Yeah, I mean her her Instagram for the show is in English, but perhaps it is it rolls right off the tongue in the native. If anyone can, you know, send us an audio uh message of what that would sound like in Russian, we'd love to know. Um, I'm I'm just so looking forward to telling Spencer all about Horkina show because I mean my hopes are that she'll just she'll come out and, and redo her person trying to escape from a silkworm sack routine mm. that she was known for. I don't remember what that was, but the ghost in a sack routine. Was that a Nemov show that she did that in? Ah, uh, iconic. Um, I want to thank you so much for saving the day and joining me um, here in sickbay at Gymcastic headquarters, Evan, and filling in for our beloved Spencer. Thank you so much. Do you have any final words of wisdom to impart? Happy to do it. You know, sending Spencer the best. You as well, Jess. I don't know why you insist on... Um, celebrating Easter anymore if, this is, if you needed you know any more reason not to do that Kathy said this is not a Jesus take the wheel moment and this is also not a Jesus resurrected moment so uh your health depends on it um and yeah just uh happy to be here you know obviously we could talk about gymnastics all day so it's always fun to come back and uh yeah see see how far we've come yes Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, remember to get your live show tickets. Evan will be there. And um, we will see you on Friday at noon Pacific for behind the scenes. And if you have any questions for him, you can for us, you can always send those in or put them in the form. There's a VIP section for Club Gym Nerd members. And until then, thank you so much for listening. Remember to take off on gay, split on rights, and we'll see you on Friday. Thanks for listening.